Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a tag video. This is the Yola Bokoflod PDX book tag which was originated by Margaret Pinard and I was tagged by uh, Ros at Scully Dandling about the books. So Margaret Pinard is a writer as well as a booktuber and she has put together with other people uh, an indie book festival um, in uh, obviously it's online but she is based in Portland which is why it's PDX because apparently that's the shortened form of, of Portland and uh, I suppose sort of arising out of that she's she's come up with this original tag so um, Yola Bukaflod is an Icelandic tradition uh, as she explains it a country without uh, trees uh, books become a very precious thing because obviously they will have to be imported or at least the the paper and wood pulp have to be imported if for um, you know indigenous writing and for Christmas which is the yol part of uh, Boca Flod Boca as in book and Flod as in flood it's a tradition to um, you know give books and to spend a cosy uh, evening around the fire sometime over the Christmas period, just doing nothing but reading these, these sort of precious artefacts called books, which is uh, a nice a nice idea. So uh, Margaret came up with this tag, and um, so it's partly the sort of Icelandic tradition, and it's also partly about to support the Independent Book Festival. So, uh, prompt one, the name. What is an unpronounceable or difficult to pronounce word you love? Well, syzygy is a word I find really hard to pronounce, but I wouldn't say it's a favourite word of mine. I mean, I use all my favourite words in my own writing, and I must admit I've never used syzygy. It's something to do with sort of alignment in uh, astronomy. Um, so I can't really count that one, although it is a word I struggle to pronounce. So uh, the word I'm going to go for is, is not an uncommon word, but I really struggle to pronounce it properly, and that is phenomena, phenomenal, uh, here we go, phenomenology or phenomenal phenomenological um, which is a bit uh, alarming because my current work in progress is all about uh, phen phenomenology but I can't say that word um, yeah uh, prompt two the tradition what is a new to you tradition or retelling of one that you love well I don't really do traditions uh, I'm afraid I don't mark any religious uh, festival uh, including Christmas to me it's just days off uh, from work um, and I'll come back to my version to try and give a, an answer to this but I just wanted to say that I've um, been thinking a bit recently about when uh, Her Majesty the Queen dies I mean she's getting on uh, Britain will be plunged into 10 days of national mourning in which there is nothing no shops open no TV or at least the BBC which is obviously a state channel although I suspect none of the other channels will be allowed to everything is basically black armband and silence which is going to be really grim um, imagine if we're still on some sort of lockdown and you have that so you have no you know, nothing you can watch or whatever um, and I, I say this because you know I'm, I have no feelings towards the royal family one way or the other other than when Princess Diana died uh, for the day of her funeral you can't say it's a bank holiday because it wasn't a holiday but they did give us the day off um, so we could all cluster around our TVs and watch it but I'm proud to say that the record shop that I worked for called Rough Trade Records uh, refused uh, to close and stayed open and it was actually in the borough of Kensington Palace where uh, uh, Charles and Diana lived um, which is why it's known as the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, and we resolutely stayed open, which I was rather proud of. Um, and so I, as a writer, have an attitude of I have a day job that pays the bill so I can get on with my writing. That was one of the few days I was enthused to go into work, I must say. But I don't think I'm going to have an equivalent with uh, if the Queen dies, because the whole country is going to get shut down. But anyway, so much for tradition. Uh, my actual answer to this is, so I can't talk about any, type, any sort of type of Christmas tradition or anything around that. But I've just, I mean, I don't watch many uh, dramas on TV because I, I don't have the time to commit to them. And I don't really like binge watching dramas. I don't mind binge watching documentaries, series. Um, but I don't, I'm not a great one for binge watching dramas. Um, 
but for, and the other the other thing is I don't watch Scandi Noir because they're all subtitled and when I watch TV I tend to be multitasking and doing other stuff at the same time which you can't do if you're watching something which is subtitled uh, but having said all that I, I sat down to watch something called The Valhalla Murders because it sounded quite good which is uh, an Icelandic crime noir th uh, series of eight 45 minute episodes and there was a tradition, I, I say a tradition, there's a protocol in there which I found quite intriguing because obviously in Britain our police are not armed, although we have armed response units, whereas virtually everywhere in the else, everywhere else in the world the police are armed. Um, Iceland is sort of part way between the two because there was a scene in which the female police officer needed to get a gun to uh, before she went into a warehouse in a difficult situation so she had to radio into her hq to get the, the the numerical code for the the safe that was in the in the police car in which the gun was contained so she didn't carry it on her all the time like american cops do um but she's not unarmed like british cops are so it was kind of an interesting eye-opening thing to me that there was that sort of halfway house and it comes from Iceland where this tag is originated from so yeah you know, that's what I'm counting as tradition certainly new to me uh, prompt three the adaptation what is an adaptation of something you love that was made even better or equal uh, none I've spoken many times how I'm wholly against the idea of adaptation I think artists in their various media should uh, create within their various media and not borrow from other media stories or ideas and then and then sort of go their own way with it. I, you know, this may be a very unpopular view. I know retelling of myths and stories and, and all that are very, very popular, but I'm afraid not for me. Prompt four, the mood. What is the cosiest book you've read or expect to read this winter? Uh, um... <laughs> Again, uh, not to see too churlish, but I don't do cosy. Um, I think this is the question that Roz was quite intrigued to tag me with, particularly because she knew I'd struggled to do it. But I won't scowl like I normally do when I get this question. Um, question five, the discovery. Who is a new author you've discovered this year that you love? OK, I'm going to talk about uh, two authors. So the first is Robert Perisic, whose debut novel was called Our Man in Iraq, which I read this year. Very, very good. He's a Croatian writer who still lives in Croatia. Um, and his second novel came out this year called uh, No Signal Area, which I haven't read yet. I hope to be able to squeeze it in, or oh, that's quite chunky, uh, before the end of the year. I don't know if I'm going to, but I am looking forward to it. It's quite rare that I read two or more books by the same author in the same year. I tend to steer away from that, unless it's Clarice Lispector, who uh, I do. Uh, and the other writer I've literally discovered in the last month, um, and that is Una Kazur, uh, her book Dark Spring, and her other book, The Trumpets of Jericho, which I read today. She was a member of the... She was German. She was a member of the Surrealist movement. Uh, so she was mainly a, a, an artist, uh, rather than uh, an author, but she did publish poetry and three novels, or at least three that have been translated to English, and they're quite extraordinary, uh, her writing. And uh, so she is a new favourite, but I don't know how much more of her stuff I'm going to be able to get my hands on, which is slightly, you know, uh, disappointing, but what can you do? Um, she committed suicide in 1970. Um, Prompt six, the setting. What is the deepest, darkest setting you've read about? Well, uh, in a novel of mine, which is as yet unpublished, that's so not the one that's going to be published next year, it's one I've just started submitting to publishers. Um, it's about post-mortality uh, and, you know, whether technology can provide a, a sort of afterlife by preserving consciousness in digital form. And I've set that novel in a ICBM uh, nuclear missile uh, silo, deep, you know, right at the bottom. So that's pretty deep down. And uh, obviously there's all sorts of uh, associations with death because it's a nuclear bomb silo. Um, but uh, a writer, this is Clayton Eshelman, Fracture, uh, a collection of poems inspired by the uh, Paleolithic cave paintings uh, found in France. Both the famous one, uh, which I now can't remember what it's called, and one that he managed to get uh, access to, which is you know quite difficult because they, these are obviously protected sites. And most of this poetry collection was inspired by 
by that. So I'm just going to read a sample. Um, there is a hole through which I crawled, an umbilical cord of light. I feed in this light and it is itself a tunnel, outside of which there is only space, darkness and stars, and a head, an enemy head, that thought me up. How I hate this head, I must live by. Next to, under, how I hate having to imagine what conceived me, but my soul, my halo material, is stuff I have to drag out of me. My fingers are little fangs and they tear at the entrance of what must contain. Once the organs are pushed aside, a chamber in which a fabulous coupling is taking place, all brown and runny with eyes gleaming through the powerful brown stream. One hairy bearded dragon mounting a beardless one, or about to mount, its pink bloody sabre braced to cleave. So he's that sort of describing, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite an epic poem, it sort of goes on and on, but he's describing entering the hole to get to see these cave paintings. It's a really narrow crevice by which he gains entrance. It's a fabulous collection, uh, and he's still alive. I think he's about 85, um, but whether he's still writing or not, I don't know. Um, oh, and another one which I've forgotten. Hang on a second, I'll go and get the book. So this is by a contemporary writer. This is Stuart Evers, uh, who I follow on Twitter. This is called The Blind Knight, and the novel came out this year. Also with a nuclear theme, the, the whole backdrop of this novel is basically Britain's nuclear history from uh, the Second World War to through the Cold War. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's brilliantly done, how he uses that context, where he's basically looking at a family drama across that span of 40, 50 years, but always with reference to, to this, to, to the nuclear backdrop. And there's, there's an early scene in here where uh, we had national service up to about 19, I can't remember exactly, 58 or 60, something like that. And uh, the, gu the, the, the main guy in here is, was called up into the army uh, to serve. And he found himself up in Cumbria, right near the Scottish border, and um, one of the things that, that, that he was training for was uh, to react to a nuclear um, bomb having fallen. And the authorities had built or had constructed a village or a town, small town, that had been, you know, as if it had been hit by a nuclear bomb. And the level of detail that they, they'd come up with, like sort of, you know, dolls with their, you know, sort of, blasted faces and things like that the amount of creativity they they develop they they devoted to to the art of destruction it's it's just mind-blowing you just wonder well if you if you could have used that energy creatively instead of making us all live under the nuclear threat you know what a better world we all would have lived in it's it's a really good book i mean it doesn't do anything flashy it's not it's not experimentally formalistic or anything but it's a good solid store piece of storytelling of a period that largely covers my own life. I mean, it does slightly predate it because it's talking about national service. Um, OK, uh, prompt eight, The Hot Cocoa. What is a book that comforted you during a long night, literal or metaphorical? Well, it's not what's a single book. Uh, I will say that when our twins were born, it was all hands to the pump for me and my wife. And it was only when they'd sort of got to the stage of only needing, say, one or two feeds uh, through the night, that my wife, up to then my wife and I had taken one twin each and slept in the same room as that, and we'd each taken responsibility for just making sure that twin was fed and changed and all that sort of stuff. But when that settled down a bit, we changed our routine so that I did the night shift, because I was an insomniac anyway. I was used to being up through the night. I wrote through the night, although not at that, not at that stage. Um... And then I would crash into bed at five in the morning and my wife would wake up and take over. Um, and sort of within that uh, dynamic, it was impossible to do anything, really. We were both like zombies. Um, and I wasn't reading. I certainly wasn't writing, but I wasn't reading either. And it was probably when they were about six months old that I, you know, I, I felt... I wanted to gingerly return to reading, but I, I didn't feel I had the capacity, mental capacity to do anything weighty or ideas led so the books that i picked up were the uh, patricia cornwell um novels based around the her character Kay scarpetta the the um the pathologist you know who, who conducted um post-mortems uh in criminal cases and sort of turned detective through doing that as well 
and they, you know, I would always be very grateful to those books. They're not great books, but they, they got me back into reading. You know, I read about five or six of them without reading anything else. It was just reading those, and it was through that gradually, as I say, I got back into reading, and I was able to pick up more, more of the type of you know, serious literature that, that I like to read. So I will always be very grateful to those books to ease me back uh, into reading. And the final prompt, The Gift. What is an indie book you'll be giving this winter season? Well, the first thing to say is I can't give any of my own books um, <laughs> because I've I finally sold out of them. Um, and I'm not inclined to buy any more of my publisher because I've got a new one coming out and the focus is going to be that one. Um, and if I did need one or two uh, copies of my own book to, to give out or whatever... I, I, you know, I'd probably go on Amazon and 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 you know buy them there because they're not, you know, they they'd be cheaper. Um, and I, I was always waiting for that moment at which point my books could be purchased for one or two p, two pence, uh, which meant that my royalty payment would outstrip them. You know, my royalty payment would be fifty p or whatever it is. Um, therefore, I could make a genuine profit. Uh, but sadly, it's still hovering around about five pounds ninety nine. I think anyway. So, um, in one of my more recent tag videos, I th it was either the Friends or the Enemies tag, I can't remember which, I put out, there was a question about a uh, recommended indie author. And I said that most of the indie author books I've read by Friends, who are writers, are genre, and I don't really read a lot of genre. So I put out a call in that video, if anyone could recommend me more the sort of stuff I'm interested in, which is sort of experimental and, and sort of, you know, high literary formalism and stuff. Um, and Rebecca Granderson came back to me and sort of said, I should check out uh, a pub publisher called 1111 Press, um, which I haven't had the chance to, because I think I, that video only went live yesterday. But I'm, you know, I'm really grateful to Rebecca for suggesting that, because uh, that sounds like right up my street. So I may well end up getting books uh, through them, um, but I won't be giving them to other people. I'll be greedily reading them myself. So there you have it. Um, thanks very much to Margaret Pinard and good luck with the festival as well. Uh, and thanks to Roz for uh, nominating me. Um, as I say, I think she did it with a, a knowing wink, knowing that I would struggle with a couple of those questions. And indeed I did. Um, so till next time, thanks very much.